Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this panel, the focus on trans masculinity in film and TV. I am Nick Adams. I'm the director of transgender representation at GLAAD. Uh, GLAAD is a nonprofit organization that works with the media to be a resource to them, to media content creators, as they tell stories about LGBTQ people. And my job is to primarily work with Hollywood content creators on transgender storytelling. And I've worked at GLAAD since 1998 and I transitioned myself in 1997. So I have a long history of trying to improve the way stories about transgender people are told in mainstream media. And I'm so incredibly excited to be moderating these, this panel today with this incredible creative group of transmasculine people. So welcome to the panel. Uh, I'm gonna say some stuff here at the top to sort of uh, set the groundwork for this conversation. And then I will gladly turn it over to these smart people to talk about their work uh, creating stories about uh, trans men and trans masculine people. So first I wanna start off uh, just with a little bit of like terminology and lexicon information. So during this panel today, we're probably going to be using the words transgender, trans and transmasculine a lot. Transgender and trans are both umbrella terms that describe a community of people that include a lot of very diverse gender experiences. So we're using transgender and trans in the broadest possible way to include the experiences of many, many, many different types of people. Um, and transmasculine is a word that the community uses. And while there's not 100% agreement on what that term actually means, for the purposes of this panel today, we're going to use the word transmasculine to mean anyone who was assigned female at birth, who now identifies as a transgender man, a non-binary person, or someone who may not use either one of those labels, but was assigned female at birth and is sort of like no longer feels like woman or female is the best word to describe themselves, if that makes sense. So we'll be talking about transmasculine people to include a very large and diverse group of people, uh, all assigned female at birth and who are all transgender. Um, you also may on this panel hear AFAB sometimes, and that simply means assigned female at birth. It's an acronym for that. Um, now, whenever you put a panel like this together, uh, there's so many talented people who could be on this panel and it's very difficult to make a panel that is representative of a, a group of people as diverse as transmasculine people are. So we wanted to like um, mention the names of some folks who couldn't be with us here today, but who have contributed a lot to this conversation about transmasculinity in film and TV. First of all, Sam Fader the director of Disclosure, which you can watch now on Netflix, and I hope that you do. And many of us were at Sundance last year for the premiere of Disclosure um, at the Sundance Film Festival. Sam is currently in the midst of a booming campaign to be shortlisted for an Oscar this year. So let's all cross our fingers that that actually happens, which would be amazing. Um, also want to mention Silas Howard, who whose film that he co-wrote and directed with Harry Dodge, uh, I Hooker by Crook actually premiered at Sundance way back in 2002. So Silence has a very uh, long history um, of in this industry of telling stories about trans people and is currently hard at work on the new season of Dickinson right now. So couldn't join us today. And there's so many other people like Brian Michael Smith, Quintessa Swindell, Ian Alexander, Blue Del Barrio who are out shooting TV shows right now and couldn't be here for we are at a moment in time right now that's kind of a flex moment. Like there's been a tremendous amount of invisibility for trans men and trans masculine people in Hollywood. And at the moment, we actually are starting to see some change and some of the people that could have participated today are busy working, which is super exciting. Um, and what we're gonna do when we post about this panel on GLAAD social media, we're going to create an opportunity for all the trans masculine people who are out there telling their own stories, creating short films, writing web comics, whatever it is, to identify themselves and uh, uh, promote themselves in a, on GLAAD social media. So keep an eye out for that when you see the social media posts about this panel, because GLAAD wants to elevate and amplify the voices of all trans people who are storytellers and who are creating media about our lives. So this panel has a lot of diversity in it, but it, no panel can represent all of the diversity within the transmasculine community. It's just not possible because we're such a large and very diverse community. But we think that the people on this panel do have very differing experiences that they can speak to about what it means to be transmasculine and that the experiences of the people on this panel can help inform kind of the growing cultural conversation about what is masculinity, um, and, and I hope that on this panel today, we're gonna to talk about both media representation and how our stories can contribute to this cultural conversation about what it means to be men or what it means to be masculine. Um, now I get to introduce the panelists. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna do a short introduction about them, but 
when they start speaking, hopefully, well, I know they're all gonna talk more about the amazing things that they're doing to tell stories about transgender people. So forgive me for a minute while I read these little intros because I don't wanna get anything wrong. We are super happy today to have with us Yancey Ford, who is a director and producer and the first out transgender director to win an Emmy and be nominated for an Oscar for his documentary, Strong Island. We also have Dilo, who is a queer and trans Tamil Sri Lankan American actor, writer, comic, who can be seen on Netflix, HBO, CW, Amazon, been doing this work a long time and is in, can be seen in a lot of interesting places. We also have Bobby Menuez. Uh, Bobby is an actor who's appeared in Adam, I Love Dick, Euphoria, and is also a talented transdisciplinary content creator. We have Sydney Ballou. Uh, Sydney is a ballroom historian and a journalist whose work has been published in the New York Times, Vice and Them. He is a proud member of the House of Extravaganza and is currently co-executive producer and writer on HBO Max's show, Legendary. Um, Elliot Feliciano. Elliot is a trans Puerto Rican writer and director whose films have screened at the Outfest and Bentonville Film Festivals. He's assisted on Stars Vita and is currently on, on FX's Pose. Leo Shang was at Sundance a couple of years ago with the film Adam, which also starred Bobby Menuez, and is currently starring in the L Word Generation Q on Showtime. Alex Schmitter is the Associate Director of Transgender Representation at GLAAD, works with me on helping Hollywood do a better job of telling trans stories, but is also a producer and has produced uh, two documentaries, Changing the Game about trans student athletes and Disclosure, which we mentioned before, which is on Netflix. And Scott Turner Schofield is an Emmy nominated actor and the creator and star of Becoming a Man in 127 Easy Steps. He is also a sought after trans consultant on projects like Euphoria, The Craft and more. Oh, what a panel. Like, I literally, uh, oh my God, I just love you guys. Okay, so we're gonna start the conversation today um, a couple of years ago, um, we started a transmasculine cohort in Hollywood to try to help connect some of the transmasculine people who are working in this industry as a professional development and networking uh, project. It was started uh, with 5050 by 2020, which was a project founded by uh, Joey Soloway as part of the Time's Up movement. And at one of the meetings, uh, the transgender writer, Thomas Page McBee, actually made this comment where he said, you know, transgender men don't even exist in the imaginations of most people, including the decision makers in Hollywood. So for me, that really resonated. And what I heard him to say, what, what, what I took away from, I guess, his statement was that it's not so much sometimes that maybe people are intentionally excluding us from films and TV shows, so much as it doesn't even occur to them to think of us to input into something. Because we just for decades, most representations of transgender people in film and television have been about transgender women. And if you ask people to think of the word transgender, they probably envision a transgender woman in their mind. They don't really envision us typically. And I think disclosure, if you've watched it on Netflix, you'll see that for decades and decades, most representations of transgender people in film and TV were of transgender women, and they were not only inauthentic, they were defamatory and stereotypical. And Disclosure does a really good job of showing us the harm caused by those representations to transgender women. So like we know that we have to continue to tell stories about transgender women and trans feminine people to begin to undo the incredible harms caused by all, everything that you see in Disclosure. And we always stand in solidarity and support of those stories and amplifying them. But I think one of the things Disclosure also talks about is the fact that there has been this invisibility of trans men and trans masculine people. And in some ways that invisibility is a privilege when you live in a transphobic culture, but at the same time, there is a price for invisibility. So I'm curious, for, I guess, for my first question for the, those of you on this panel, uh, just taking a moment before we kind of go forward looking and talk about the past and talk about um, the impact of that invisibility of transmasculine representation in mainstream culture for you. Like how did it affect you personally? And this is not directed at anyone. So it's all of you can unmute yourselves now <laughs> and uh, just don't all stare at each other and wait for somebody to go first. So who would like to start answering the question about like the, the price and the cost that invisibility of transmasculine people has had for you uh, in mainstream media? Um, I, I can go first. Uh, I know for me, I feel like had I seen more trans or any trans masculine representation growing up, I feel like 
I would have been able to figure out who I was at a younger age and I would have transitioned a lot sooner. I didn't transition until 2017. And it was only then because I had seen a trans Latinx uh, man on, Insta on Instagram. Um, other than that, I think I still would probably not be sure of who I was to this day, you know, had I not seen that representation. Yeah, for younger people, you were more likely to see it on YouTube or Instagram probably than in mainstream media projects. The old like me to go back to when there was before the internet. Who else? Does anybody yeah. else want to speak to that? You know, to speak to that, you Glad often asks this question, you know, what, you know, who did you first see that represented you in film and television? And honestly, if I really sort of go back to it, there's nobody in my in my upbringing until, and you know, I can't even say until Boys Don't Cry because Boys Don't Cry was played by Hilary Swank, who's a cis woman, right? So that was sort of this moment of representation of the story, but not at all of the person. And so I always say, I don't know, Alf, like, <laughs> you know, some kind of alien masculine creature out there. That's, that's really where I go to. And I, I just want to echo as well, Boys Don't Cry was the first time I saw somebody that I could relate to in that experience of gender. And I, I describe that moment as being such a relief that I wasn't the only person in the world that was having this experience. And at the same time, it was completely terrifying and probably postponed my own self-acceptance and self-discovery for another decade. Because if that is the only thing you see of yourself, there's not much future to imagine or envision. And so like Elliot was saying, then I started seeing people sharing their own stories on social media and understanding that there was so much more diversity and there was actual possibility in the becoming of ourselves. Um, you know, Scott, I would say that I, for me, the closest I think, and I, I, don't, I don't recall when the movie was released in relation to Boys Don't Cry, um, but the closest representation in trans masculinity that I saw um, uh, was in the film Set It Off uh, and the character played by Queen Latifah. Um, and, you know, for me as someone at the, you know, at the time who identified as a butch lesbian, when I saw that character, you know, the, the subtext to that character as it was played in that film spoke to something else. And I knew that it was there um, and I didn't know what it was called. Um, but I definitely recognized it when I saw it. I'm going to piggyback off of what Yen said, and actually what everybody said. Um, when I was younger, I saw, um, I, I also kind of went back in the closet as a young person because the first representation I'd seen of trans masculinity was through the Maury Povich show. And it was like such a, a shit show. And the way that they just came for him, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, while I was like so eagerly watching this cat on, on uh, and he was a white cat, but I was like, oh, wow. And then the, it was like the minute that he would say any, anything, the whole audience just turned on him. And I was like, okay, I see what I'm up against. And, um, and so also it, it definitely determined the, the pace at which I was um, spiritually okay with who I was. Um, and then in addition, I think that, um, you know, even though Boys That Pray came out, I never watched it. I heard that somebody died. I was like, I'm not, I'm not about this. Um, I was like, I don't need to relive the thing that I'm fearing for every single day. And then I watched it years later and I still in many ways didn't, didn't uh, relate to it. And I think that being raised in community with other black and brown and South Asian queer trans masculine or studs, whatever was like, was enough for me to know that I was okay. And I'm grateful to community for that because literally there was nothing and I could create with those people. And I'd like to, you know, later I'll, I'll talk about like what creating in community has done for me personally, um, not just career wise, but just on a, on a very beautiful level, uh, a creative, beautiful level. Um, yeah, I like really to... want to get to that as well. Go ahead, Sydney. Oh, I was going to say, just to add to Dilo's point, you know, I think for me, um, Definitely being in the ballroom scene is very special because obviously we're in a very multi-generational, very LGBTQ, heavy emphasis on the Q plus community where you get to see sort of like 
sometimes future versions of yourself. Um, and I know for myself, um, I mean, when I first came out, I was a proud little butch lesbian. And that was also partially because that was the language at the time. Um, I think for me, sometimes with trans stories, trans narratives, like there's this heavy emphasis on like, you always knew you were this thing. And, you know, it's like everybody was wrong from the get go. But I kind of have a hard time um, sitting with that because for me, it's like, you know, I can't even equivocate my life in, you know, 1995 versus the way that like little trans kids are growing up today because one, I didn't have that language Two, that's not necessarily how I saw my body or how I saw myself. Um, and I definitely am very proud that I had that experience growing up as a little black butch lesbian and experiencing the world in that way. Um, and I think for me too, I mean, I'm 31. I think, um, was it Elliot who said, uh, you started transitioning in 2017? Same thing. Um, and for me, what did it was actually seeing black trans men, black and Latinx trans men in the ballroom scene. Because at the time I, I was actually living in Europe and I, I saw a lot of white trans masculine people, but I didn't you know, feel like I saw myself. But then once I remember it was Seven King who had like a little YouTube um, web series that heavily centered on black and Latinx trans masculine folks in the ballroom scene. And I remember at the time, Teek Milan was also very vocal and speaking out a lot. And I remember saying, oh, okay, I see myself. Like that's actually a version of myself that I see and I understand. And at the time I was already in the ballroom scene. So it was a moment for me to also put on that role when I would walk uh, like butch realness, which is a category where as a butch lesbian, as a cis uh, woman, you're supposed to portray like a straight cis man. And it was like the first time I really felt at home in my body and not only at home in my body, but truly celebrated. You know, I remember people just going up for me because I finally was able to own my masculinity as an AFAP person. Um, and, you know, obviously that's something very special to ballroom uh, is that we do that. But um, I think, you know, to Dilo's point, that idea of community, you know, also supporting you in your transition and in supporting you and celebrating who you are. I, um, for me, that was a very special thing to, you know, what ballroom is. Bobby, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I just am really like feeling a lot of resonance around the gratitude for what community does to making it possible to become yourself <laughs> or making it feel possible. Um, I just think about you know, the effect of not seeing the representation for me, you know, I started acting before I was out in a lot of different ways. Um, and I was out as queer, but I just had a lot of blockages and around kind of stepping into my gender. And I mean, I just remember thinking like, because of the lack of representation, if I choose to transition in any way, my career is going to be over. That's just what I thought. And I had to actually kind of just like relinquish the possibility that that might happen to actually step into all of those things for myself. Awesome. I want to make sure everybody has a chance. Leo, I realize you didn't speak up either. Um, no, I'm just, uh, I also, a lot of the things that have been shared really um, I'm sitting with too. And um, I think about, um, being probably one of the younger <laughs> ones on the panel and like being part of that social media age of uh, um, seeing like the only trans men on a screen that I saw, I think early on, before I came out were on YouTube. Um, and even then predominantly white uh, trans men who could very well be perceived as cis and, and very um, narrow, standards are beauty. So I think it was, I think, um, you know, this, the steady increase has really, it feels like it's given, I think, I think uh, someone said, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who said it right now, that the permission to feel that, the permission to feel um, like lean into what my, masculine, what my masculinity meant and what it felt like and what it meant beyond just simply like my expression, but like who I felt I was. Um, I think a lot of folks will have associations with like boys don't cry and like I saw that after I came out I saw that in film school which is 
oof. Um, and I saw um, many of us saw Max, and I think um, I think Max I think on, it's, it's on the original on, Max on, on the original, original L word, L word. Who, yeah. who was at the time played by somebody who was not out as non-binary. Danielle is out as non-binary now, which I think is important to acknowledge. Um, and and I think like it's hard. It's hard to think about the times that I felt like I saw someone that really like in a whole sense, I felt like I could relate to. Um, the earliest, the earliest reference I'd ever give people was Mulan, the Disney animated movie Mulan as like an, as a Chinese American person. I'm like, even before I came out as a, as a tomboy, you know, I'd be like, think about Mulan. Like that's, that's, that's kind of basically who, what I'm doing. <laughs> like, that's my thing. And even then it's like, God, what is happening? Why am I using this Disney film? That's not super accurate as the point of comparison for my identity. Um, and so, yeah. It's just, uh, just, just really listening and agreeing with literally everything that's been said. And it's just, I think, I think too, you talked about the various, the, the wide variety and diversity in our experiences. And I think this single question too has really <laughs> highlighted that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I heard all of you speak to to some degree or another, I think is like trying to look and see like what your future is gonna look like. And some people, you know, can look, can maybe find a hint in the media, maybe of what your future could be. And it might be terrifying if you're watching Boys Don't Cry or some other story about trauma and violence. And, or it could be hopeful, even if it's not historically accurate, like Mulan. And if you can't find it in uh, mainstream culture, you can maybe find it in community and people that you know, whether that's literally YouTube self-made content or community as in ballroom, which I think is important. And I feel like this idea that we want to know as trans people who mostly were raised into, you know, brought into homes who don't have any trans people in them, um, what our future is going to be as a trans person. And we look to the media to try to find that sometimes. And that kind of leads into one of the second things I wanted to talk about is, you know, one of the things I find frustrating is I both want to, you know, look and find stories that might hint at what a future could be for trans youth, you know, people younger than me. Uh, or I want to look at the past and see, like, do I have a history? Do I exist in the past? And historically, like, when cisgender people have looked at assigned female at birth people who lived as men in the past, they sort of had this knee-jerk reaction to tell one or two stories about them. Either, oh, they were just a lesbian who wanted to be with women, but they couldn't because it was homophobia, so they lived as a man so they could be a lesbian. Or... They were just really ambitious women who wanted to do a man's job. So they lived as men for 50 years uh, to, to work at a job as a stagecoach driver, let's say. And so both of those instincts, I think, by cisgender people just erase the possibility that those were trans men in history. And, and I'm not trying to say all of them were, but if you, were, if you don't even consider the possibility that Albert Kashir and um, you know, Billy Tipton and other trans men in history were men, you've really kind of taken away our past in a sense. Um, and the, there's a documentary out right now on the festival circuit that if you haven't seen, I hope that you will watch called No Ordinary Man, um, directed, co-directed by Chase Joint, a transgender man, co-written by Amos Mack, a transgender man, with Aisling Chen Yi, an ally who brought these folks in to tell a really co compelling story about how Billy Tipton, who was a jazz musician born in the early 20th century and who died in the 80s, um, lived as a man for many years, how his story was distorted by the media after his death and really sensationalized and turned into this story of lying and deception and reclaiming him as part of our past. So I don't know why I'm bringing this up exactly to say, except Scott's in No Ordinary Man. I can't remember now. Is anybody else in? I don't think so. I think Scott's the only one who's in it. But it's a, it's a really powerful documentary and it speaks to like, I can't even find our past sometimes because those stories have been uh, not brought forward in the best possible way by trans voices who could understand our history. Does that resonate with any of the rest of you or is it just me? basically. Well, to speak to the No Ordinary Man piece of it, I loved what a, what a direct hit it was against the book that is really the, the, you know, only major tome we have for Billy Tipton's life. And it was a book that misgendered him, that disrespected him. And to have his actual family on video say, he was a father, he was a man, you know, and to see how, how they were manipulated by it 
I loved how it just peeled that back and said, no, this is what you've been taught to see. And, you know, I, I also worked in a, um, I starred in a film that you can't see out here. It's had worldwide release, but has not been shown in the United States called uh, The Conductor. And I played a character that was based on Billy Tipton, but set in the 1920s. Again, long before we had language for this. And it was a really interesting struggle because the director and writer was very um, moved by the book about Billy Tipton and therefore caught in the frame of Billy as an ambitious woman and yet hired me. Uh, and so I brought my all, everything that I bring to it. And when people do see the film, especially trans people, they're you know, there, it's always a question as to what, it, what do you mean by this? And so I always just say, and I said it in the DVD extras, I said, look, if it's really true that like trans men are just ambitious women, like think that through. So you're going to spend your entire life hiding from everybody, right? You're going to go through gender dysphoria, by the way, because if you're not really trans, then you're, a, you know, if you're a cis woman dressing up to be a man, that's going to have like a really intense mental effect for you. What? So you can have a job. Okay. So what happens when you, so you have a retirement at the end of your job. That's what you do your whole life for. Right. And then it creates a caste system again, right. Of smart women who dress up as men and pass as men and, you know, dumb or unfortunate women who don't or can't. And it's a hierarchy created then by cis women against cis women. So it just like makes no sense if you like give it half an extra thought. But for people to listen to that, I realize that's like a really advanced uh, way of talking about this, even though it's pretty simple, right? Um, I'd like to jump in, because um, Scott, you do bring up a good point, just sort of the sort of ridiculousness of the roundabout ways people will kind of like, like unjustify our existence, I guess is what I heard. Explain away our existence. <laughs> Come up with every other, possible theory <laughs> right. for it, except uh, he was a man, basically. Right, right. Um, well, I was gonna say, cause it reminded me, so before I, um, I got into writing about ballroom for um, different publications, I was in a PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania and doing my oral histories work on the ballroom scene, which is the basis of a book that I'm writing. And one of the things that I've learned as just being an archivist is history is never a reflection of the past. It's actually a reflection of the present. Because in the present, we are asking questions about our past. So the fact that I think the world has a better understanding of trans masculine people, we have the language, we literally have our voices that are being heard in different ways. Obviously, based on what we just said, you know, we've had to eke out in social media, on you know, Instagram or YouTube or whatever, uh, we found a way to, to speak out. I think um, today, you know, we finally have the tools to rectify some of those issues of the past. And I think a lot about, um, there's a really great uh, professor, Jen Mannion, who's at Amherst College, who is a professor of transgender, transgender studies. And I remember they gave this really great presentation because they were looking at transgender people um, in early America. So like, you know, the 1700s and that kind of thing. And there's kind of some difficulty of how do we, how do we describe these people? Because really they live their lives in what we would consider to be transgender. That may not be the language they use then, but it is important to label it as such or to, to make that very clear of, look, you know, this is what somebody was doing in the past. And also this is how it relates to us in the present because it's proof that we were always there. And, and the issue is that the people who've written those history books before people like Jen, you know, they didn't know we existed. <laughs> they didn't have the language to even acknowledge that. Um, so it's a lot of the pioneer work uh, that I think we all have to do today. And obviously that's always about rectifying the past because that is what our present is. Does anybody else want to come into this or we can move on because I want to talk about how we are rectifying it, but I don't want to leave this topic if somebody else wants to chime in on that right now. Well, I just wanted to add to what Sydney said, rectifying our past and owning our present for ourselves. I, the disability community um, coined the phrase, nothing about us without us, which has since been amended to say nothing without us because we are a part of a long history 
of existing when the language may not have been the same. But I think that's probably going into Nick, what you're going to ask next about how can we share our stories and what are the stories we want to see? And I think so much, so much of that is being able to tell them for ourselves and not have them be told for us. Mm-hmm. Well, that does kind of bring me now to like the current situation, I think in, in Hollywood or in mainstream media, which is that there are not very many trans people or trans masculine people who have any sort of uh, their hands on what I like to call their hands on the means of production. <laughs> so not too many people who have got the ability to green light a TV series or fund a $2 million movie or a $10 million movie or, you know, um, so I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we're sort of in a place right now where if you do want to tell your stories in a, in a way and in, a, in an outlet and a platform that is going to reach millions of mainstream kind of average media consumers, Right now, we need to work with cisgender allies who do have their hands on the means of production and who want to be allies with us in terms of telling stories. So I personally um, am, am grateful that there are cisgender people right now in positions of power who want to do the right thing in terms of telling more authentic stories and hopefully empowering trans people to tell our own stories. But it's, you know, it's a fraught relationship because sometimes they don't know like how to be the best ally or how to uh, work with us in a collaborative way to tell our own stories. Um, Does anybody want to talk about what they have found to be effective in terms of trying to leverage and work with the people who do have control and power in Hollywood and authority to tell more authentic trans stories on screen? Like, what has that looked like for you? Has it, have you felt like you've had successes in terms of getting your story out there? Do you see it as a means toward getting your own hands on the means of production in a significant way? I mean, there are some people like, you know, Rain Valdez making Razor Tongue just herself, as far as I can tell, and getting an Emmy nomination for it, which is awesome. So there is that like, just make your own content. Um, but if you want to make your content on Netflix or on Amazon or on HBO Max or any other major platform, At this moment in time, I think we have to work with the cisgender people there who want to help us tell our stories. Does anybody want to speak to like what that process has been like for you? I'll just jump in. Um, You know, it's it's funny as a as a trans director, the kind of projects that have been coming to me. um, That you know, the few that do have representations of trans masculine characters are usually so far. Um, you know, on, on either end, it, you know, it's like a, like a teenage love story um, or some sort of, you know, like, you know, end of life, someone's already died and then they've been discovered in, in, in you know, obviously like a derivative of, of Billy Tipton's life. Um, it's been tough to, it's been tough to really, to, to really figure out who, you know, speaking of imagination, who has imagination enough to see trans char- see trans masculine characters as real people, um, and that for me has been the challenge. It's that you know, like everyone who like, you know, everyone who has their their hands on the on the means of production, um, and who control the decisions, they're all individually nice people, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they understand. Um, what they're doing when they when they generate these scripts, these pitches, the, the ideas for, you know, for content that they think is, um, you know, representing transmasculine characters well. Um, and I'm not quite sure how um, that shift is going to happen, but I think it begins with people um, admitting that they don't know. And I think that that's something that's really hard for, for people in Hollywood to do is to admit that they don't know something that they really want to know very badly. Mm-hmm. I'm going to piggyback off of what Yancy said um, to the point of not knowing, like a lot of people didn't go into TV and film production as allies. They came to like, you know, make their art. And so this ally game in the, in the industry is like, it's a, it's 
people are learning that that's part of what you have to do now. Uh, some are reluctant um, and some are really trying their best, but they don't, they haven't figured out the full equation still, you know what I'm saying? So um, a little bit about my history is that, um, you know, I've been doing theater and stand up and for, for a long, long, long time. And, um, and so I always thought that it would be based off of that, that I would get a leg in because every time I'd show in front of agents, they literally said, we think you're talented. We don't know what to do with you. And then the tables turned around like maybe five, six, seven years ago. Right. And so much has changed within that time that, you know, initially I was like, okay, now I could get my acting that off. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then it was like, oh, but still these roles and what it is that I'm trying to do, how do I marry what I've been doing on the stage to, to what's out there? So now it almost feels like over the past couple of years, I've kind of just been like, you know what, I'm going to go to these meetings, whether they're the generals or with production companies that are interested in working with me. And these are like, you know, Paul Feig's Powder Keg and Samir Gardezi's BTR, who now works with Pop Culture Collapse. So these are like these areas that they're kind of like middle folks who understand that they're lacking in representing a whole heap of folks, not just trans masculine people, but a whole heap of folks. And they're trying their hardest to bridge that gap between what can get greenlit and, and the creators who have been creating, right? And time and time again, I feel like there one thing that I, I feel like outside of like looking at your supremacist ways or just like just, you know, uh, racism light uh, in the industry. Um, I think that sometimes it's also like, you know, the very same things that I see people get a leg up if they're white or cis or even sometimes white and trans. I feel like there's like every time I go into a room and they're like, oh, well, we don't have the director for this or we're going to pair you up with this person. I always have to advocate to get brown and black and South Asian and Asian peoples in the rooms, who have queer folks, because even on a very small scale, like I'm not like making things that are that are going straight to a streaming or an HBO, but like even on a very small level, I always have to advocate for for people. And and I think that that is kind of um, that it's that thing about what Yancy was say, talking about, like people don't people don't know how to do the thing, but yet they're also going well, we'd rather fit you with somebody that we know is good, even if, they were, if they're white and cis, you know what I'm saying? So, so it's sort of like constantly advocating for our people in the room on the race tip, on the gender tip, on the, the whole thing. And just a, just a little sort of sprinkling in, I just wanna end off with this. I think that sometimes the hardest part about talking about our trans masculinity is the fact that a lot of us have been in communities and have been raised and creating with communities that haven't necessarily been trans masculine, but have been sort of pan queer. And, um, and so therefore it feels like, um, it, it feels like a little bit separated when we only have to work around our trans masculinity. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. Can you say a little bit more about that last thought Dilo? Yeah. Like just, just explicate it a little more. Sure. Um, so one of the things that like, when I look at the QT BIPOC folks that I work with consistently and who I've built relationships with, a lot of them are not only trans. A lot of them are um, cis and queer, uh, queer, queer folks of color all across the gamut, right? And I'm kind of one of those people who like, whenever there's a young person and they want to work, like I'm like, oh, there's this project and this project. I'm like, like basically like collecting people into my circle. And, and it is a, I feel like sometimes centering our stories doesn't necessarily mean only working with trans people. Like it can involve working with cis people if they, if they actually believe that representation is important, if they believe that your story is important as part of that representation, and if they're willing to help you with that story. And so I feel like I can lean back against like the, the, the mentors in my life who have guided me, who have not been trans, who have been very, very super, super duper queer, and, the, and, and who have sort of like helped me sort of figure out like a rubric in which to con consistently create within community. So what we're sort of talking about is like how you can, how, 
have there been productive instances of collaborating with the cisgender people who have the power to, you know, develop this pilot or green light this show? Um, and, and the challenges associated with it as well, because um, they clearly still exist, even though we see those cis allies being more open to the idea of working with us to elevate and amplify our stories. Um, I'd like to jump in here because I think, um, well, one, I think I've been very lucky with Legendary, specifically with HBO Max and Scout Productions. Scout Productions, um, they are the people who do Queer Eye and they're the production company behind Legendary. You know, I remember when I got the call from the showrunner last year about working on season one, uh, they had seen my work in the New York Times where I had written about the ballroom scene and had talked about my relationship to it, being in it. And there was a clear match where they were like, you know, it's easier for us to train somebody who's a writer from this community to write for unscripted rather than try and train somebody from the unscripted world of being a writer to try and understand the hugely complex world of ballroom. So in many ways, um, I feel like I was very lucky that HBO Max especially really valued my work um, as a community member. I've been in the scene for 10 years. I walk balls, I've thrown balls, I've won trophies. And, you know, like I've looked at it from every single angle and they could see that that authenticity was really important to creating the show, which is obviously a hybrid of sorts. You know, you can never get 100% ballroom on TV, but um, to at least value my perspective, not only as a member of the community, but also especially as a trans person, um, because I'm definitely the, the you know, highest ranking trans person on set as a co-executive producer for the show. Um, and they do lean on me for my, my perspective of, you know, the way we're asking questions, the way we're portraying stories and that sort of thing. Um, so I think, you know, really having those executives who are cis white women um, who really understood that this is important, um, not only for the community, but also for um, trans representation, for um, also getting people in the door, you know, at the end of the day, this is a business, right? And like these titles, these credits, they're important. They entitle us to things, they entitle us to future positions, they entitle us to money, which, you know, is also about access and power. Um, so I feel like there was a real investment on their part, um, not only on as, you know, for me as somebody who works on the show, but also for my career, um, because it has opens, opened a lot of doors. And I do think when I take meetings, like at the moment I'm taking meetings for management, for writing, and I find that like, there's a demand, you know? If anything, I think the issue, there's almost like, um, like a skills gap, I feel, um, because there's only so many of us who um, are like producing things that are really in your face or that we're getting the recognition that we need. I mean. 100% the fact that the article I wrote for about ballroom was in the New York Times gave me a lot of credibility for getting my foot in the door. And, and I feel like for a lot of us, it comes down to that of like, what big white institution is backing you, right? In order for other people to take you seriously. And, um, you know, I recognize for myself, it's a huge privilege. I've definitely had many opportunities to help me get here. Um, and it's obviously just more um, impetus to like, open doors for other people when I actually get to that position when I can do that more. Thank you so much for saying that, Sydney. And I also want to say that like this idea of like reaching out and finding you is is partly great on their part as allies to give you, you know, the credit and the leg up or whatever. It also makes their show better. Like I think the best cis allies in Hollywood are the ones who realize that if they want to stand out in an incredibly crowded marketplace, that they need something that's going to like be different. And by different, I mean real and authentic and a story that hasn't seen, been seen before. And to Yancey's point, because they don't even know what they don't know, the best way for them to leapfrog the line and make something that has that special sauce of true trans storytelling is they have to work with the trans people behind the scenes to to tell that story, like it makes their product better. And I just wanted to add to what Sydney was saying as well. I mean, the way that I got into producing my first film, Changing the Game, which is a documentary about trans high school athletes really came from a cisgender, straight, white man filmmaker ally who was actively seeking 
a trans person who had the skill set to match what he was looking for in elevating that person to a producer role to oversee this story that we were telling, to really restore these trans high school athletes stories to them when they're so often hijacked. And Michael Barnett is an Emmy award winning filmmaker. He had Mars Generation premiere at Sundance and he had the wherewithal to know what he didn't know and know what he needed and to work in partnership with me so that every step of that filmmaking process we owned together. And I think that's to Delo's point, we shouldn't need to be advocating for ourselves to be valued, for our perspectives to be taken really seriously and put into consideration. That should be actively sought out. Um, and that's the model that I've experienced with changing the game and why I'm so proud of our film is because I really had ownership in that and making sure that the young trans athletes stories were told from their own perspectives and that they felt seen and heard in the final product that we then released. Bobby, I saw you take yourself off of mute there. Oh, yes, I did. Um, I'm just loving hearing everyone. Um, I just was thinking about the other side of the coin to how cis allies and other cis people in the industry are realizing our value as other members of the, of the community. Um, and, and that those opportunities are happening. And I'm just thinking about the way in which there's this pressure put on, you know, the sometimes only one trans person on a set, whether they're in front of the camera or behind the camera. And, you know, every time I'm the one trans person on a set, I'm just grateful that I'm there, to be honest. Um, and and that it's like, you know, the first person getting their foot in one door makes it possible to open that door for other people too. And that's real. But um, I just, yeah, I just want to like kind of get into that piece about how, you know, just the way in which like, obviously trans literacy has its own learning curve for people who are not of that experience. Um, and there's just kind of like, and this goes beyond the film industry and TV industry, but just the way in which like the labor of trans people to educate is just so just like expected. Um, and I just have noticed in like all the projects that I've worked on since coming out, the way in which like people on the other side of the camera are asking for my opinion on things that, you know, it, I love a collaborative process, but you know, sometimes I'm like, just go talk to someone at GLAAD. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, or just like, don't ask me how the movie should end. We're on set right now, I'm about to film a scene. You know, just like, it can be very interesting to see how like, it can tip from just like really honoring and respecting the opinion of a trans person to like feeling entitled to a specific kind of labor that deserves compensation and like, deserves additional crediting maybe you know and like just like the point that Sydney made about like that shit counts um and I mean I guess another piece that I'm just thinking about in terms of like projects that I've been working on it's been one thing that I've been getting into for me in my you know in different roles that I've been like coming up for and attaching to is like finding roles that were like sort of written maybe for a cis character that I then I'm like, but what if that person's not cis? Like, I don't know. I just like, yeah, maybe she uses she pronouns, but what if she binds? Like, and it doesn't have to be a part of the narrative in like a big, big way. And honestly, like, I feel like I'm echoing a lot of other people in my community by being like, it's really fun to also see stories that include trans characters that are not like centered around that experience mm -hmm. or like needing to, you know, just like, amplify that as the main part of their whole life narrative because it's not <laughs> um but that's been like something that I've been getting into that has been really exciting for me just especially in terms of like where I'm at in my own presentation and like how that limits certain like casting possibilities for me and um yeah I mean I just am I'm thinking also like the the bottom line when I'm like approaching a project and you know I don't always get to work on a project where there's trans people on the other side of the camera but for me that's just always like 
it's kind of a red flag when there's no trans people on the side of the camera. And it's also just like an invitation to any cis ally who wants to tell these stories to just like, you know, there are a lot of talented, very talented, like on this panel, trans people Mm -hmm. who, who can take that role and step into that. And, and also maybe it's a new talent and it, it does take, you know, taking a chance, but it's definitely worth it. And there's a level of authenticity that can't be achieved otherwise. I'm, I'm only quiet, Bobby, because I was going to see if anybody else was going to chime in there because you said so much, this notion that like, oh, you're trans and you're here to do one job, but we might ask you to do three more jobs because we don't have anybody else to talk to is a form of allyship that perhaps people could reconsider. And that, you know, that, that, that labor of having to do education, if that's not what you're hired to do, is an extra job. And there are other resources people could look to to that. Just just to kind of respond to that, I, I have been really excited about other kinds of roles coming on set. And I just was thinking of a sp- particular instance working like on a project that did have GLAD involved and it was doing a lot of like the right things. Um, and I've been really excited about this new role on set of intimacy coordinators, which is like something that has come out of the Me Too movement and like was not, did not come, like did not come into existence to support trans people. But in my experience on set, specifically in a situation around nudity writers, which have really outdated language around gender um, and like bumping up against that and like just a little technical thing that was so dysphoric being like, why are you telling me I have to sign a nudity writer that says my nipples are female nipples? Like, why are we doing this right now? And, and it was an intimacy coordinator who stepped in and managed that situation and mitigated that situation. Because I think one thing is, is that like, yeah, people are going to mess up. They're like, not every part of the process is caught up to the the new standard. And so I'm really curious about how can we incorporate different kinds of accountability processes? How can we have like people who are not just like, oh, like you're my cis ally on set, but it's not your role to like step in in this moment. Like maybe that that needs to be formalized. You know, maybe that is an extension of intimacy coordinator kind of roles where it's like, okay, what happens if the people, if like the actor keeps being misgendered or the producer keeps being misgendered? Like, does it always have to be them to like write the awkward email? Um, so I'm curious about that and excited about that. That's awesome. So I want to cover, if we can, in the next few minutes, a couple of things before we go. One is the notion of like, and this is like complicated and a little nerdy, but this is Sundance. So I think it's good to talk about it. The pipeline idea, like this individual cis allies might read out great, but then like the industry has all those diversity pipeline things, right? And one of the things we've noticed recently is that some of those diversity pipeline programs mentioned uh, open to like women, trans women and non-binary people. And then there's like no mention of trans men at all. And trans men have reached out to GLAD to be like, can we apply for this? And I'm like, we don't know. And then we go to them and they're like, well, yeah, we kind of meant trans men, but we forgot to put them there. We didn't, they don't think about us as needing perhaps those diversity pipeline opportunities. So has anybody else, I want to talk about two things if we can, the diversity pipeline thing. And then also like what we what is the call for action going forward in terms of where we want to be five years from now? How can Hollywood help us get there? How can we, you know, reach out for that brass ring and get our hands on the means of production going forward. So since we have limited time, and sadly, um, I'm going to throw both of those out there and anybody can speak to them that wants to. I know some of you have been in those diversity programs. Leo. I can't, I don't think I can speak too much to the diversity pipeline programs. I'm not as familiar with that. So I don't want to take up space on that. All right. Um, when I'm the prompt about five years from now, I mean, this is something I was thinking about when Bobby was talking too, is like one thing I noticed that I do, and I think that um, people in positions of power hone in on is this idea of gratitude that like we express gratitude so much that we're grateful for the position we're in that they kind of take advantage of that and like use it to their, to their power of like, so give me more. Like, you're so grateful to be here. I need more from it. Like, give me more of that. Like, give me, you know, do I mean like I'm seeing nodding, so I'm hoping you know what I mean. Where it's just like, they know you're grateful so they and they likely know that you'll do things to to stay in that position like you'll continue doing labor you'll continue educating them um and that's something that i hope five years from now is fucking gone 
I think that goes for not necessarily not only us, but people of many marginalized identities and many intersecting marginalized identities of, of this idea that we have to be grateful for the position that we're in. And I think like, yeah, that's, we can have gratitude and we're allowed to like, we are allowed to still have critiques and criticisms and like problems and feelings and thoughts about what's going on in a pro project that we're brought on into. Um, and so like, it doesn't have to be that you're so flooded with gratitude, you don't do anything else. That, that's a power, I mean, that's definitely a structural power issue that I hope at least five years from now is different. Maybe it's too much to ask for it to be gone, but at least different that we're, we're not only is our, uh, the knowledge that we carry of our lived experiences and these like essentially free diversity trainings that we're giving, but like that it's not expected that we don't have to be doing those in the sake of gratitude. That's one of my hopes. Another hope, as I have said before and will continue to say is I fucking wanna see trans people in fucking huge fucking movies. Sorry, this is three times. <laughs> I wanna see like awesome rom-coms. I wanna see around queer rom-coms, not just like the assumption that like when people transition, they're still in like cis or heteronormative relationships. I wanna see like the, the spectrum of relationships and chosen family. I wanna see us in more superhero films. I wanna see us in whatever the hell we wanna, if, in space, put me in space, you know, like I don't care. Um, I wanna see us, it, 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 it's, it's hard for me not to be like, I want what cis people have, but I want us to be treated with the same reverence and the same like, like assumption that we can do this the way cis people are treated. It's not like I want, that I don't want to be treated as cis. I want to be treated the way that cis people get treated, um, actors particularly. I, I want to be able to do things. I don't want, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, the characters I've played so far are, have all been trans or the gender's not been specified. I'm happy with that. I love it. I, I want to be considered for any role, you know, and I, I, want, I want that potential to continue to grow. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm not going to take up too much time on that. But that's, that's what I want everything. <laughs> good, good, good. Yes. Can I just say a shade of that, Leo Shang? I want everything. <laughs> everything, darling. All of it. A hundred percent. I want to just give a little bit of that back. Okay. I'm feeling it now. Because yeah, I I mean, what I hear from that is again possibilities. We've been talking about possibilities, 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 opportunities. For me, you know, it's definitely about that. I, five years from now, I mean, I'm owning the means of production. I have my own production company. I'm getting the Shonda deal of 250 mil to develop. Let's go, baby, I'm here. Um, but, you know, very seriously, I, I mean that of, you know, I wanna see more of us behind the camera. You know, I wanna see more of us writing. That means having those opportunities. That means also the big thing for me is mentorship. Okay, because the way this industry works, it is everything about who you know, who you're working with, whether or not they see you and they even know that you exist. Again, we go back to that visibility question. So, you and know, the pipeline diversity kind of like networking, who do you know? Who do you know, exactly. So, you know, for me, it's definitely being able to work with some of those big names. They could see my work, know that I'm here, know that I can continue to do it. And yes, I'm with Leo, we're getting everything. Five years from now, everything. I'm here for it. I also think that the pipeline programs have got to remember <clears throat> that at a certain point, the pipeline has to stop. I think that what happens with a lot of underrepresented groups um, is that, you know, there is this notion that we have to be in perpetual mentorship, this notion that, that we'll never be ready, that this notion that we're never actually, you know, like have the skill set to step into um, the leadership role, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera. I think it's important for people who partner with the mentorship and the pipeline organizations rather to remember that the people who come through these pipelines are as qualified to do the jobs that you're looking to fill as the folks who come from outside the pipeline. Um, and, and five years from now, and thank, and thank you for that like really short achievable timeline because there are so many people in the pipeline you know, and who have just gotten out of the pipeline, um, you know, who are ready to go now, who are ready to work now, who should be cast, who should be hired now. I think that that for me is one of the most important points that we have to make sure people don't get stuck thinking that we belong in the pipeline for the rest of our careers. I think where, where there's a bottleneck for the pipeline close to the end is in distribution. 
right? I think about your work, Yancy. I think about Strong Island and what a departure from like documentary storytelling that was that had nothing to do with you being trans, except that perhaps as a trans person, you think expansively, right? Or I think about um, Dilo has this, you know, you're, you're short about forgiving the air traffic controller who, you know, was involved in your sister's death, right? And then finding out she's like a, tr a Trump supporter, right? Like, like that is some fascinating stuff where we keep getting stuck in this place of, oh, well, we already have a project in that space. Oh, well, you know. The trans space, we already have a trans show. Right, which means that they have something generally about trans women, right? And like not, not even looking at us as larger storytellers, right? And so this is where my particular real like sort of focus is now is getting the funding for just getting the funding and getting the distribution for stories by trans storytellers that don't necessarily have to have anything to do with it because we are expansive creative minds with so much to say. And I think a real ability to transform the way that we see in general, if you would only see us. Okay, so unfortunately, Sydney has to leave us right now because he is in production for Legendary as we speak and has to go back to set. So I want to say bye to Sydney. Thank you for everything you contributed to this conversation. Genuinely, it's been a pleasure to know you over the years. Go back and make great television, and we'll see you on the flip side for whatever the next thing is that we all do together. Thank you for participating, but the rest of us are going to stay and have some more wrap-up thoughts. Bye, thank Sydney. You, thank you, everybody. Mucho, mucho love. See you all soon. Bye. Okay, God, I love Sydney so much. Okay, so now the rest of us, uh, I was like so panicked because I was like, oh, Sydney, I forgot he has to go back. So now we can have some final, final wrap up thoughts again about like either the sort of like pipeline idea and the fact that it's both an opportunity, but also not perfect and it has a lot of problems. But where do we want to see ourselves in five years? Because Nancy's right, that is achievable. Like five years ago, was it trans representation in Hollywood was very different than it is now. We've already made like a tremendous amount of headway in five years. And we're just getting started. So like, what is five years from now gonna be like? So Yancey sort of spoke to it a little bit. Leo sort of spoke to it a little bit. Like who else wants to speak to it before we wrap up? I know y'all do. Elliot, um, yes, please. Um, just to piggyback off of what Leo and like Sydney had said, like I do wanna see us behind the screen, in front of the screen, you know, as the leads telling our stories. I would love to see an all trans writer's room, you know, a mix of, you know, mask Shocking. and, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I just, I feel like we're just not, we're not seeing enough of our trans mask stories being told and showing us as the heroes. So I just, I think we need to definitely see a lot more of that within the next coming years. And it definitely is achievable. So. Awesome. I'm having kind of a funny thought come to mind, which is um, I just think about how I, I have this term ostensibly cis that I like to use sometimes <laughs> um, just to make space for all the people who are actually just in the closet. <laughs> um, and the thought that I'm having is just that I want more of our quote unquote cis allies to just hop on over like enjoy. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's kind of a funny thought, but it just came to mind. And I mean, I definitely want to echo Leo Shang's thought that we want everything. We deserve it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just also want to like, um, like not make people who are in a more like gender questioning space feel like they can't be a part of this experience and that it's not maybe a part of their own experience already. Um, what do you have to say, Dilo? Five years from now, I mean, I want the same thing that everybody else wants, um, more work. I think that like, you know, it's, we all got in this game thinking that we can make, you know, some money off of being creative souls. And, you know, while a lot of us have been fortunate to get those checks and whatnot, like, I think that sometimes people don't even think they can even create because there's not enough financial stability for somebody who's trans, not just trans masculine, but, um, and, and that, and that the, the little pockets of folks that we have out there who are doing works, like our community, who, who we know well, like even trying to get to that spot is like, a, it, you know, it's, it's also its own pipeline um, in, a, in another way. So I think that just, it's, it's sort of like, you know, we are 
creators. We don't, <laughs> for us to write a cis story is very easy. <laughs> We're surrounded by cis people. You know, like for us to do a lot of things is very easy because we have this very multi, um, multicolored lens, I guess. So, um, so it's just about, you know, getting our people work, I think, at the end of the day, just having a lot more of us out there. And I just wanted to add, having more of us out there and seen creates more representation. I, I wish I had... Bobby and Elliot and Dilo and Leo and Yancey and Sydney and Nick and Scott and so many more people to look to and say, oh my God, I can do what they're doing because I relate, I see the possibility of what they're achieving. And I think so many times when we talk about representation, people think we mean just in front of the camera, we want these characters. We want real people to be able to look to and aspire to in our own becoming. And so I just hope for more representation across every industry, across every position, across everything so that people see more possibilities of who they can be. Do you wanna add anything, Scott? I think everybody else has spoken. No? Well, I have loved this conversation. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to give one more opportunity. Have we missed anything in this conversation that we should have talked about? We have more time. Is there anything kind of last parting thoughts that anybody wants to say? Yes, Leo, was that a finger? What I'm hoping for particularly is more, I mean, we're talking about like tra the trans, like trans community as a whole and like, I need that inherently includes all trans people, but like specifically like trans people of color for me and like trans people with disabilities. And you know, people who still have even more, have different, even different hurdles to, to, to getting in this into, in the industry. And I think like, when I think about the, the roles of like the characters of trans men that I've seen who did play, imp like even were impactful, often were, again, like when I mentioned before on YouTube, like white trans men. And I think like, what I what I'm hopeful for is is um, maybe maybe that's addressed on the sh on the shows. Maybe that's something that's in conversations in the scripts, you know, or maybe it's behind the scenes. I just I'm hopeful for uh, the, because masculinity, like manhood, patriarchy, are also very tied to whiteness and and white supremacy and and colonization. And so, like, how are we addressing that? And I uh, if we are addressing it, so I just I just really hope to see more. Um, BIPOC trans folks, uh, trans men, trans masculine folks um, behind and in front of the screen. Yeah, this is literally why I wish we had three more hours to talk because we didn't even really touch on the, the idea that our stories have something to say, especially BIPOC people talking about masculinity, talking about different types of being men. Um, I think that there is something really important that we can share in this cultural conversation. And, but I think we didn't get to that because we want to share it in our stories. And right now we're having a hard time even getting our stories out there. But I think that again, coming back to this notion that the people who have their hands on the means of production, they want something new. They want something fresh. They want something different. There's just like this untapped well of talent on this Zoom and Sydney and everybody else out there that we know who, who hopefully are going to name themselves in like glad social media to say like, I am a transmasculine person and I have a story to tell. There's such an opportunity to do so much. Um, and it, it's not even been tapped yet. So I also think it's a good business decision to look at the things that you just said, Leo, to address that to, to the first person that has the truly, truly breakout show that has an all trans writers room, Elliot. Um, it will dominate the, you know, the earned media space if it's good. And I think it will be. So there's such a business opportunity as well. And um, Yancy, I heard you speak about that a few years ago at the Trans Summit at Outfest, actually. Uh, and you spoke about it really eloquently. That This isn't just about doing the right thing. It's about doing something that could conceivably make you a lot of money because you have this enormous untapped talent pool and untapped stories that haven't been told. So in my dream for five years from now. All of you will be household names, first of all, because there's no reason why you shouldn't be. So that would be awesome. And I really want us to have that trans showrunner and that trans network executive or that trans acquisitions person who knows how to buy the right stuff.
right? So that when you see Razor Tong on YouTube or you see something that D'Lo has created and you're like, oh my God, D'Lo, you're like Tamil Sri Lankan American private eye who's like, you know, out there solving crimes in his neighborhood. Like the acquisition person who's like trans and sees that and is like, I'm gonna buy that and put it on whatever, you know? I think in five years from now, we'll be there or really close to there. And I'm very excited about you all and your creativity and your skills and your talent getting us there. So I want to end by thanking all of you for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And not only that, like thanking you for everything you all do every day in your private life, in your social media, in your creativity, in your working. I know all of you. So I know that you're out there like, grinding and creating stuff and creating art. And as a trans person who can't do any of that, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply grateful to all of you. So thank you so much for today, but thank you for everything you do all the time. Say bye to everybody. Bye everybody. Thank you for watching our panel. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thanks everyone.